الذي هدانا الى دين الاسلام وما كنا لنهتدي لولا ان هدانا الله واكمل لنا ديننا واتم علينا نعمه فرضي لنا الاسلام دينا فلا نعبد الا اياه ولا نستعين الا به نشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له جل وعلا رب الارباب ومسبب الاسباب ونشهد أن سيدنا ونبينا مولانا محمدا عبد الله ورسوله بلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة فجزاه الله عنا وعن كل المسلمين خيرا اللهم صل وسل وبارك على سيدنا محمد عبدك ورسولك النبي الأمي وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا أما بعد رب يسر ولا تعسر وتمن بالخير وبك نستعين يا فتاح رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأختة من لسان يفقه قولي رب زدني علم ونهقني بالصالحين سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم سبحانك لا فهم لنا إلا ما فهمتنا إنك أنت الجواد الكريم My dear respected elders, brothers and sisters in Islam Being put on a spot is a position no one feels comfortable in If someone abruptly puts you on the spot and asks you a question that you don't know the answer of, nor do you want to be asked that question, 
you find yourself in a very uncomfortable position. The options one has on the table is one of two. Either to, either to continue dodging that individual, or the second option is to empower yourself with the knowledge and understanding so that you can confidently confront that individual and answer their question. For some odd reason, the Muslim world has and continues to hide or dodge in a presumably state of fear. For as a unit, we haven't thus far resolved the questions that continue to haunt us as an Ummah. For close to two decades now, there are certain trigger words that we don't want to talk about because it doesn't seem to be healthy for us and our image in the greater society. For example, do you believe in Sharia? A hot topic. A topic that is used on media, a topic that is used in mainstream media to make us as Muslims look bad. But put yourself in a situation that if you at your workplace or in school were asked the question, do you believe in Sharia? I'm sure you would get a shovel, dig a hole and put your head in the ground hoping that people would forget and move on. Do you believe in jihad? Understand this. These terms have become so scary to us it brings a chill up our spine when we hear it. And the third question, does your religion oppress women? Do you believe in Sharia? Do you believe in Jihad? And does your religion advocate the oppression of women? Why is it that we feel to ignore these issues is beyond me. Do we blame it on culture, or do we just blame it on sheer ignorance? Whatever it is that's causing us to continue to dodge these questions, instead of confronting them by educating ourselves and becoming a source of educating the masses, deleting jihad from our text, denouncing sharia, and defaming Islam's post on women is the position we are seeing being formed as a solution in the next generation. There are Muslims who call for the term jihad to be taken out of the Qur'an. There are Muslims who openly say and preach Sharia has nothing to do with Islam. What fuels this is our silence on these matters and us, due to our silence, allowing others to define it on our behalf. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us Islam. Allah selected you. He didn't make a mistake when He was giving out Islam when he was giving out the opportunity to bring forth solution on this earth, he didn't make a mistake by choosing you or your family. He didn't make this religion a source of inconvenience or difficulty for you. You could stem this back all the way to Ibrahim a.s. Ibrahim a.s. was pure, upright and just. So was Musa alayhi salam, so was Isa alayhi salam, and so was Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi salam. They all follow one and the same traditions and doctrines and teachings. Never can we ever assume in the slightest form in our mind that our religion is a problem. But it has become a problem because I, because I resorted to being silent on these issues while others in the name of Islam continue to define what it was on our behalf. 
So today, my friends, I want to put an end to the theory that Islam demonizes, discredits, oppresses women, and strips them from their rights. For to me, this is completely bogus. My hope is to educate us all, to dispel the rumors dominating in our world, and to challenge the cultural norm which we deem as Islamic. I want us all to see that Islam brought to the world something that was absent before it, and how the world functioned after the teachings of Islam in the absence of it. I implore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He opens our hearts and minds to understand the beauty of Islam, the flawlessness of Islam, the perfection of Islam, and the power Islam has to bring about goodness on this earth. Ameen, Ya Rabbil Alameen. I don't have the time, and you all don't have the time for me to address all three of these issues. So today we'll stick with women. And there are five points that I want us all to take home in regards to this. Number one, the question, are men and women equal? In a world today where women are striving for rights, in the 21st century, in the modern world, the question that we need to ask ourselves, are men and women equal? We turn to Surah Nisa, the chapter of the women, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals verses that in the midst of the darkness that had engulfed the world, this divine revelation echoed in the wide desert of Arabia with a fresh, noble, and universal message to humanity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bismillahir Rahmanir Raheem. Ya ayyuhan nasu attaqu rabbakum alladhi khalaqakum min nafsin wahida wa khalaqa minha zawjaha wa batta minhuma rijalan kathira wa nisa'a. The O oh mankind, keep your duty to your Lord who created you from a single soul and from it created its mate and from them both had spread a multitude of men and women. From this verse, we realize that since men and women both came from the same essence, they are equal in their humanity. There is no question asked. A man is equal to a woman and a woman is equal to a man in her and his humanity. This notion that women are evil by nature would imply that men are also evil by nature. Because neither gender can be superior because it is a contradiction of equality. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, from both of them emerge men and women. A scholar who pondered on this verse, he states, and I quote to you his words, it is believed that there is no text old or new, that deals with the humanity of the women from all aspects with such amazing brevity, eloquence, and depth, and originality as in this divine decree, subhanAllah. If we were to see the words of Allah in an unbiased fashion, we would see the beauty that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala presented in structuring a world where our men folk and women folk equally contribute to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them the power to do so. So number one, women are equal to men in their humanity. Number two, the subjection of women. Islam for some odd reason, even in the light of what we see currently happening within our own world, in our own societies, Islam is continuously blamed for subjecting women. Islam is blamed for using them as slaves. And these practices are aligned to what is called religious teachings. I want us all to take a moment and reflect on how women were treated in what we call ancient civilization after the advent of Islam and its teachings. In Encyclopedia Britannica, we find that women from the Indian subcontinent, in regards to them, subjection was a cardinal principle. In Hindu scriptures, the description of a good wife is as follows. 
a woman whose mind, speech, and body are kept in subjection. If she obeys her husband in her thoughts, in her words, and in her actions, she acquires high renown in this world and in the next, and she will be granted the same abode with her husband. When we look to Greece, Athenian women were always considered minors and subjects of male. Her consent in any of her affairs was deemed unnecessary. We turn to Rome where they say, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. And we find that in history, women were considered a person incapable of doing or acting anything on their own accord. A person continually under the tutelage and guardianship of her husband or other male relatives. Now, if we were to open books and read history, we would find a drastic contrast between how Allah through Islam addressed women and how society and history addressed women. But for some odd reason, within the Muslim community, there is this thought embedded into our minds that Islam truly oppresses women. My challenge is prove it. For in Islam we learn that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam through the teachings of Islam exemplified what the important role women had in society. For the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, طَلَبُ الْعِلْمِ فَرِيضَةٌ عَلَى كُلِّ مُسْلِمٍ وَمُسْلِمَةٌ That seeking knowledge is not a choice it's not an option, it is incumbent, it's a mandate on every male and female Muslim. Our religion has made it part and parcel of the deen for us to acquire knowledge. May that knowledge be directly Islamic or indirectly rooted from Islamic tradition. Any knowledge that needs to be acquired in order to make our world a better place falls under this category. So a woman had the, not just the choice, but the responsibility to learn. For both men and women have the capacity for learning and understanding. And since it's the obligation to promote good behavior and conduct in our world, it requires both Muslim men and Muslim women to acquire the appropriate education so that they can do their due diligence. Number two, we find from Islamic tradition that a woman has a voice. If you do any fair investigation of the teachings of Islam into the history of Islamic civilization, you will find that a woman's voice was not only heard, it was honored, it was respected, and it was part and parcel of what made Islam great. The Holy Quran says, Ya ayyuhan nabiyu, ida ja'ak al-mu'minatu yubayi'naka ala alla yushikna billahi shay'an wa la yasriqna wa la yazdina wa la yastulna awladahun wa la ya'tina bi buhtani yaftarinahu bayna aydihinna wa arjulihinna wa la ya'tina ka fi ma'ruf fabayi'hunna wa astaghfir lahunna Allah. When the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had women folk come to him and Swear their allegiance to him. The, Allah subhanahu is telling the Prophet sallallahu you accept their oath. You accept their oath. Why? Because their voice is valid in our world. It is said that once Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu in his time of khilafah was confronted by a woman in the mosque and she argued with him and she proved her point to him that he had to then say in the presence of the people, this woman is right and Umar is wrong. This woman is right and Umar is wrong. Lastly, post. Women hold a post in our world. Islam does not forbid women from holding important positions. Matter of fact, Abdurrahman ibn Awf consulted many women before recommending Uthman ibn Affan to become the caliph. And Aisha radiallahu anha was a teacher, an instructor, an educator. 
through her, one-fourth to one-third of our deen has been taught and preserved. Over 2,200 ahadith came from Aisha radiallahu anha. If it wasn't for her upholding her side of the responsibility in Islam, we would have, la- we would have lost close to a quarter, if not a third, of our religion. Number three, in addition to addressing the equality of women, the subjection of women, do women have a say when it comes to marriage or divorce? We look into the Mosaic law and we find that a girl's consent is unnecessary. And we find the same teachings in the Encyclopedia Biblical where a woman is the man's property and he has the right to divorce her and he has the right on every matter uh, in regards to the relationship. But we find in Islam, we find in Islam, recorded to us by Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala, that a girl came to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu and said that I was forced into marriage. My father forced me into marriage. What do I do? What's my options? What's my choice? And the Prophet sallallahu said that she has a choice. You can accept it or we can break it. On what basis that your voice is valid, your voice is important. In another narration which is recorded by Ibn Majah, she said, I accept the marriage, but I wanted to let women know that parents have no right to force a husband on them. And in regards to divorce, yes, in Islam there's something known as khula, and it's a bit different from the process of a divorce, a talaq. But keep in mind, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala presented a process at a time when there was no process and for many years thereafter, there was no process. Number four, does a woman have a right to property wealth? We look again into Roman law and into the English common law and you will find, I, I implore the people, I plead to you, look in research, look back in history and research and you will find that in historic times, in the Roman era, a woman did not have a right over her property. When she was given to her master, i.e. her husband, he became the sole owner of her property. He inherited all the property that she had, and if a male relative was to die, that property also became his. He could use those funds how he pleased. In England, only when the Women's Property Act was proposed in 1870, and thereafter amended in 1882 and 1887, did women begin to have some right over their property. My dear brothers and sisters, we know very clearly that in Islam, a woman has the privilege to earn money. She has the right to own property. She has the ability to enter into legal contracts and manage her assets how she pleases. The Qur'an states this. This is not me talking. This is the Qur'an case when Allah subhanahu says, وَلَا تَتَمَنَّوا مَا فَضَّلَ اللَّهُ بِهِ بَعْضَكُمْ عَلَى بَعْضٍ لِلْرِجَالِ نَصِيبٌ مِّنْ مَكْتَسَبُ وَلِلْنِسَاءِ نَصِيبٌ مِّنْ مَكْتَسَبٌ A man is allotted what they earn and a woman is allotted what she earns. Look back into the story of our history. Khadija radiallahu anha was a rich, affluent, successful businesswoman. Matter of fact, her money helped our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu that she spent willingly on him for his campaign and for his effort to ensure that the word of Allah reached out to humanity. And yes, in the same Surah Nisa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that when someone dies, a girl, a female, also has a right from the inheritance. Sadly, even as a Muslim community, we continue to question the authenticity and validity of why a woman gets half of what a man does. Remember, 1400 years ago, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made this statement that women have a right. When until the 1900s, women still had no right. Women are encouraged to contribute their opinions and ideas. In many traditions of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, we find that women would pose their questions directly to him. And they were 
equally contributing towards the welfare and betterment of Islam. The fifth and last thing, my brothers and sisters, the blame that women are the curse on this earth and because of Eve, Hawa alayhi salam, men have to come down from heaven to this earth. In many religious traditions, this is the belief. Because Eve made the mistake, we are down here. Where the Quran says, وَعَصَى آدَمُ رَبَّهُ Adam made the mistake. There is no tradition in our religion where it makes the women looked down upon. Rather, our Islam encourages that as a community, we work collectively, we bring forth our ideas and our strengths so that as a unit, we can do better for our families. Today, we're living in this cultural notion where only the man has a voice, the man has strength, the man has authority. That is why we're seeing Islam function only half. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our hearts and minds to see Islam and not the cultural perception of Islam. To acknowledge our religion and the beauty of our religion. To own our religion and to practice our religion. And to be proud propagators of what our religion taught us. Ameen ya Rabbil Alameen. الحمد لله الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا من يهدي الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله ونشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا اما بعد brothers and sisters in Islam this topic can go on for many more hours where we can deliberate and we could sit through scripture and find the texts that correlate and correspond with what I'm telling you today. We have to understand as we take these five points home today is that Islamic texts stand perfectly fine and correct. Our Quran doesn't need to be changed. For those who feel the Quran needs to be changed, Islam needs to be updated. The religion needs to be reformed. And Muslims need to follow a new path. Let me tell those folks, Islam is perfect, but the change needs to come to the people. As Muslims, we're not perfect. As Muslims, I'm not perfect. I'm not a perfect Muslim. I'll be the first one to say it. But I need to understand, I need to change myself to align with the teachings of Islam. I should not feel compelled to even assume or entertain the thought that Islam has to change in order to be conducive in the society that we live in today. For Islam gave from social rights to civil rights, political rights to spiritual rights, and not to forget economic rights and rights as a wife to our, our mothers and our sisters. The history of Muslims is so rich with women and their great achievements in all work, walks of life from as early as the 7th century. When you go home today, talk to your children about Fatima Fahri. Fatima Fahri, who founded a university. Where did she found the university? Where was it established? And what's the story behind it? Google it. Find out. Understand how Islam empowered everyone to become the change on this earth. Thus my point today is, it is impossible for us to continue justifying any type of mistreatment to women by any decree or rule embodied in Islamic law. There is none. I said it to you two weeks ago when we confronted the topic of domestic violence. The same verses in a hadith which are used and misconstrued are not factual to what people claim it to be. Islam is about love and compassion. And if we don't love our mothers and our wives and our daughters, then we will not have a future that our children will be proud of. Children are not leaving Islam because of outside influence. 
They are running from Islam because of the culture within it. We send salutations and blessings upon Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi sallam who taught us, who demonstrated to us, who showed us through his actions what it means to be a society, a complete society, a whole society, a productive society. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in the Holy Quran, Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi, Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu, Sallu alayhi wa sallimu wa taslima Allahumma fasalli wa sallim wa barik ala Sayyidina Muhammad Abdika wa Rasulika al-Nabi al-Ummi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa baraka wa sallama tasliman kathiran kathira Allahumma khfir lana dhunubana wa israfana fi amrina wa thabbit aqdamana wa ansurna ala al-qawm al-kafirin Allahumma arina al-haqqa haqqa wa rzukna attiba'a wa arina al-batila batila wa rzukna shinaba wa rabbana atina fi al-dunya hasana wa fi al-akhirati hasana wa qina azab al-nar ربنا هب لنا من أزواجنا وذرياتنا قرة عين واجعلنا للمتقين إماما رب ارحمهما كما ربياني صغيرا رب ارحمهما كما ربياني صغيرا رب ارحمهما كما ربياني صغيرا اللهم إنا نسألك من الخير كله عاجله وآجله ونعوذ بك اللهم من الشر كله عاجله وآجله اللهم اشف مرضانا وعاف مبتلانا وارحم موتانا يا رب العالمين آمين يا رب العالمين آمين يا رب العالمين آمين يا رب العالمين إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعيدكم لعلكم تذكرون فاذكروا الله يذكركم وادعوه يستجب لكم ولا ذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون. Please ensure that our lines are straight, stand shoulder to shoulder, fill in all the gaps in between. If there is a gap in front of us, please fill in that gap before a second line is formed. اللهم أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح قد قامت الصلاة قد قامت الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله حق لا إله إلا الله محمد رسول الله الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين سبح اسم ربك الأعلى الذي خلق فسوى والذي قدر فهدى والذي أخرج المرعى فجعله غثاء أحوى سنقرئك فلا تنسى إلا ما شاء يعلم الجهر وما يخفى ونيسرك لليسرى فذكر إن نفعت الذكرى فيذكر من يخشى ويتجنبها الأشقى الذي يصلى النار الكبرى ثم 
السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله استغفر الله استغفر الله استغفر الله Assalamualaikum brothers and sisters. I have an announcement on behalf of the Election Commission regarding the election for Shura and Ami. We are still accepting the nomination forms as announced earlier until October the 22nd and the deadline for the submission of those nomination forms are 8.30 p.m. on 22nd which falls on Monday. Jazakallah khair. Assalamualaikum. <laughs> 